was 50 years ago that this lady made, made me a gr great man. She agreed to marry me. Thank you, baby, for agreeing to marry me. 50 years ago this year, in June, actually, this year. Praise God. It's a real testimony to her endurance. <laughs> Walking in love. There you go. Praise the Lord. Holy Spirit dropped some things in me several months ago, really, just to emphasize in my own life over the course of this year, 2023. You know, we all go into the new year with new vision, new design, new desire, new interests, but we can't let go of the things that God has already instilled inside of us. It's all about building. It's not about always letting go of something in the past. It's about building on top of what God has already instilled in you. One thing about this audience here, this crowd, is we've had some things instilled in us about faith and about the authority of God's Word that uh, had revolutionized everything about our life. You remember when you first got an insight into what it meant to live by faith. There was faith in God, but it was more than faith in God. It was faith in what he said. It was faith in his word. It was faith in the fact that he is a God who will not only bless you, but reward you as you diligently seek him. He is diligent to bless you. God dropped three concepts inside me, and this is only where I'm starting. I've got a long road to go, and we're going to see how it winds around together. You ever had those kind of times in the pulpit? Apparently not. <laughs> well, I have. Maybe it's just unique to me. I don't know, but here we go. But these are the three things that God dropped inside me as, as, and he, he said, I want you to position these in your life for 2023 in a big way and in a new way, even though they're not new concepts. He said, you'll enter 2023 fearless. Say fearless. fearless. Free from fear. Fearless doesn't mean that you don't have attacks try to hit your head, but it means you've understood how to take dominion over those things and plow on through with the courage of what the Word of God says. 2 Timothy 1, 7 always comes up to me in my mind over this issue where God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, dunamis power, explosive power, of love, the love of God, which we just heard some amazing and powerful things about how to walk in that love, the agape love of God, supernatural love, and of a sound mind, fearless. God hadn't given you a spirit of fear. We don't have a reason to fear, but Satan will do everything possible to strike fear in you over the days that you're in, over the things you feel, over the things somebody has said or a a strategy that's begun to arise against you of one type or another, Satan will do everything possible because it is his primary tool against your success and against your calling. He designs things to gain your attention, to grab your focus, to move you away from faith so that you are in fear while you're endeavoring to live by faith. You know, that just is a contradiction. You're just not going to really do well. Pursuing a life and calling of faith. You're called to walk and live in faith, aren't you? Yes. You just can't do that in fear. But a second concept, here's the concept that God gave me that he wanted me to emphasize in my own life this year, and that is that this is a year to be filled with faith. 
You know, we've been walking in this for a long time. Years. Each one of us, you and me, we've been in this a long time. And yet he said, I want you to be filled with faith. You know, I thought, I thought I'd made some progress with faith. And I have. But he said, I want you filled with it. So apparently there's some things to shore up in these days that we're living in to live by faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. You know, Hebrews eleven six. it's impossible to please God. He that comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder, not just that he exists. Our life of faith is not just convincing people God exists. The devil know God, knows God exists and it's really not helping him at all. And it never will. A lot of people believe God exists. Every soldier in a foxhole, they say, believes God exists. When you're in trouble, you pray. Even the so-called atheists find themselves praying. I was really proud of the NFL just a few days ago when two teams got on their knees out on the field to pray over one of their fallen players and they were commended for it in spite of all the nonsense that's been going around about you can't do that and you can't do it in public and you can't do it on the field and you can't blah, blah, blah. Oh man, a bunch of nonsense. Instead, they got on their knees and prayed as, as many people have seen already and it was a very powerful thing. And you know that, that prayer had a very powerful result, hasn't it? Glory to God. We can't let the signs of the times and the days that we're in intimidate us, strike fear in us over who we are and where we stand, that we're people of God, we're people of faith, we're people of prayer, and we're not ashamed of it. We're not going to be backwards about it. We're going to stand firm in who we are in Christ and who we are called to be, carriers of this faith that not only believe that God exists, but that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. God is a God who rewards. We're not ashamed of that. We're delighted. Man, I'm delighted to know that God's a God that rewards. It's not selfish. It's not self-seeking to believe that God rewards. It's Bible. It's biblical. We live for him. Yes, we're not... We're not committed to only having rewards. It's Dennis, it, you guys think it's just all about the rewards. No, it's not all about the rewards, but God wired us in a way where we really enjoy rewards. I like rewards. But then this third idea struck me in this time before the Lord where he said, this will be a time to be surrounded by favor, the favor of God. Psalm 512 says, for you, O Lord, will bless the righteous. That's us. You'll bless the righteous and with favor, you will surround him as with a shield. Favor, God's favor. Living fear-free, full of faith, Surrounded by favor. That details plenty of what we can lay hold on for this year that we are fear free, say it out loud, fear free, fear -free. full of faith, full of faith. Surrounded, by surrounded by favor. Fear free, fear -free. full of faith, full of faith. Surrounded, by favor. surrounded by favor. Fear free. Fear -free. Full of faith, Full of faith. Surrounded, surrounded by the favor of God. Favor of God. And it's like, it's like a shield. Glory to Jesus. There's some protection around us. Like a shield. We're not in this alone. 
We are in this with the power and the presence of God surrounding us, encompassing us, because we remain diligent to keep ourselves fear-free. That doesn't happen by accident. It happens because we make the choices and apply the, the word in the moments that we are struck by an attack. We deal with it and don't let go or cave to the strategies of an enemy against us. Glory to God. You know, I found last year to be a fulfillment of things that Brother Copeland prophesied that it would be a year of correction. How many of you got some real severe correction last year? I know it was all the correction that that prophecy was about was not personal. There was out, outer, outside things that it had to be corrected and it was a year of outer corrections that were going on elsewhere. But I also found there were things within that needed correcting. And I'm not about to tell you what they are. <laughs> Just trust me to know that I know that I'm not alone. <laughs> you had some corrective issues going on for you too. But when he locked me in on these three concepts, it unlocked something also in me that says that this year is not to be a repeat of last year. As good as things may have been for people, God's not content to leave things as they've been. Issues that you had to deal with, God's certainly not content to leave issues as they've been. But he's given you the concepts that you can live fear-free, full of faith, and surrounded by favor. God's branded those into my brain. My brain needed some branding. Come on, you guys look really holy and extremely spiritual right now. And you are. But God took me into some things regarding what I need to really address with you here that goes in this direction. It, it starts with a statement that Jesus made in Matthew chapter 13. And I want to read this to you from the Passion Translation, which I've come to appreciate a lot. In verse 11, he says, you've been given the intimate experience of insight into hidden truths and mysteries of the realm of heaven's kingdom. Jesus told his disciples they had been given the intimate experience of insight into hidden truths, mysteries of the realm of heaven's kingdom. Not everybody really finds themselves in that. And he said this in, in response to the question, why is he teaching in parables? And so Jesus said, I've given you entrance into insights, mysteries really, spiritual concepts, hidden truths that are not really designed to be hidden from people, but designed to be hidden for people who will position themselves to embrace those things and walk in them. Amen. Revelation knowledge. He goes on and he said, for everyone who listens with an open heart, say open heart, open heart. will receive progressively more revelation. Say more revelation. more revelation. Don't you want more of what you already got? Yes. See, that's what struck me about what God really dropped inside me. Fear, fearless. Well, man, there's nothing new about the concept of living fear free. But there's insight and revelation that God wants to move us into that is progressively more than what we've walked in so far. We haven't reached the end of everywhere he's taken us. So he said, if you listen with an open heart, 
He will receive progressively more revelation until he is more than enough. But those who don't listen, you ever had people around you that don't listen to you? Sure. He said, those who don't listen with an open heart, they, they hear it, but they don't really hear it. They hear it with their ears, but they don't hear it with their understanding. They hear it from the outside, but they don't hear it on the inside. He said, those who don't listen with an open and teachable heart, even the understanding they think they have will be taken from them. Revelation knowledge changes truths into a truth for you. There's things that God said, God's word is truth. We get that, we know that. It's, they are not just truths, they are, the word of God is truth and final authority in our life. But we have to choose to hear it, don't we? It's not just a matter of reading it. You know when revelation has come to you, you can read something you've read many times and it's like it just leaps off the page and suddenly it means something way beyond what you really had realized prior, even though it's an amazing thing. It feels like you've always known it the moment you get this revelation. There's a spiritual wiring on the inside of every one of us to know that the truths of God's word is truth to us because it is a revelation of how we now live. We're not living out of our head with just concepts. We're living out of our heart. It's vital that we are people that are stewarding the revelation that God has given us. Wise stewards over the wisdom of God and the insights that God gives. You know, it's one thing to preach a message that has all the right ingredients as far as the homiletics and hermeneutics and three points, maybe four points, never more than five. That's what they, that's what they tell you for sermonizing. I haven't done that well at sermonizing inside of those parameters. I try to keep it to three points, but each point seems to have five subpoints. <laughs> but you just feel like you should keep it within three or four major points because you have so many points to point out. Revelation doesn't always yield itself to just three points or four points. It may be one big point that takes you a long time to really peel back, or it may be a variety of points. Are you following me? Is it, are you even interested in this? Is this... You know, Mac did such a good job on all that love stuff. I'd like to feel some of that love coming this way right about now. <laughs> oh, that blessed all my insecurities right out. There you go. Praise the Lord. One of the great moments in the life of the Apostle Peter... We've got it right there in the, in the gospel of Matthew. It's, it's when Jesus asked his disciples two questions. Questions are powerful if you ask the right questions. Now you never get the right answers asking the wrong questions. People ask too many of the wrong questions, but man, you ask the right questions, you can get some great answers. Jesus asked his disciples two questions. You know, these were great questions because they came from Jesus. Come on. He asked Peter, he said, who do men say that I am? Some say you're Elijah. 
Here came the answer. They didn't say, this is what we're saying. This is what people are saying. That's what Jesus asked. What, do, what are people saying? Who do men say that I am? Some say you're Elijah, one of the prophets, Jeremiah, or even John the Baptist, who had been recently executed and murdered. Just the answer that they gave tells you how desperate Israel was in those days and how deep into trouble they really were. They believed, many believed in reincarnation. In Israel, the synagogues actually, ruins of ancient synagogues that you look at, there are astrological signs that are in some of these ancient synagogues. And there are signs that Israel was in trouble at this point in time with their beliefs. And of course, the Romans had come in, the Italians, God bless the Italians. You have Italians here today? The Italians had come in. And they'd brought some of their demons with them, I'm sure. All right, that was rough. They'd also apparently bought into, or some of them had bought into the idea of having uh, channeling, that Jesus was channeling the spirit of John the Baptist. That was men's answer. We've got weird answers like that going around today about God, about Jesus, about you as a leader in the kingdom of God. But here's what Jesus went on to ask. He said, but who do you say that I am? Now we're down to the real heart of the main issue. And Peter, you know the revelation that he got. He got it right then. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. The one that they had been believing would come for their entire life. In fact, for generations they had been looking for. Suddenly, Peter gets the understanding that Jesus is the one, the one that we've been looking for all along. It just looked way different than the way that they had been expecting. And this really didn't end up playing out the way they had expected in Jesus being murdered as he was. They had been looking for Jesus or the Messiah to come and reestablish the authority of God in Israel, drive the Romans out, return the greatness of God to Israel. And that didn't seem to be the way it was going right now. But Peter still had this revelation. It shifted everything in that moment. And Jesus even said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, Peter, but you receive this from my father who is in heaven. Don't you know Peter felt good right then? He had just been commended by the master right there where all the other disciples could hear it. I received revelation. And he had. He didn't steward that revelation just right over the next few minutes. <laughs> Sometimes revelation that's not stewarded right doesn't end up bringing the result that it was intended to bring. You remember what he did? Jesus started to tell the disciples based on this revelation, the things that were about to happen to him, that he would be arrested, that he would be convicted, that he would be murdered. He started to go through all this scenario and the Bible says in just a few verses after Peter got this great revelation that Peter pulled Jesus aside from whatever he was saying and doing, pulled Jesus aside. And then it says that Peter went on to rebuke the Lord. That was not the idea of getting revelation about Jesus, that he would tell the Lord the way this was going to go over the next few minutes. He rebuked the Lord. Now you understand in walking with Jesus that as a believer, there are going to be some rebukes going on, but 
you will always be the one being rebuked and Jesus will always be the one doing the rebuking. Do you get that? Say, I get that. That's a real revelation for some right there. Now I'm messing with you, but this was a, this was a big issue. So Jesus straightened Peter out, but he didn't kick Peter out. Mary had a revelation. Mary came to Jesus in John chapter 12. And it says that Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard and anointed Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled with the fragrance of that oil. Very costly. She had a revelation that this was the time to anoint Jesus and to honor him. She had a revelation that at that moment, none of the disciples really had. In fact, all of the disciples got upset with her and Judas even said something to Jesus about this, that this costly oil, probably worth about a year's wages of the average worker, very expensive box of oil, that she had just poured out, that that was a waste. Why the waste? They couldn't see it. She had revelation they did not. She saw something they did not. What did they do? They attacked her by trying to correct this situation. Jesus set it straight. She did this because she knew this is what needed to happen right now. Jesus commended her and said she'd be spoken of from that point forward and she's being spoken of to this day even in this service because of what she did. The point I'm wanting to bring out is simple and it's layered and faceted but it really comes down to this. You have been given and I have been given the marvelous honor of handling revelation knowledge. Not just sermonizing or not just writing something to be written, but to really have revelation of what God has had in mind for mankind from the beginning. He wanted to reveal himself and show himself to people and he would do that through the new birth but also through those who were born again being the vessel and vehicle to bring that insight and revelation. That's you and me. We have to handle this with that in mind. In these days, we understand there's a pressure and we realize that Satan has an agenda for you and the revelation that you've been given. Of course, he doesn't look at it as revelation. He looks at it as deception, that you are deceived. He sees you as the most deceived. The great deceiver, the most deceived, sees you as the enemy. But what we're beginning to find all over, all over the kingdom is that there are those who have walked in our position of faith, loving God, serving Jesus, but they come under pressure or they don't steward the revelation of who they are in Christ and who God is in them. They don't steward that with the honor and divine respect that it deserves and it begins to wane on them and they start to look for other ways of doing what they do in ministry. 
and in serving. And it changes from being about service to being about success. Now, we all believe in success. Don't get me wrong. We believe God wants us to succeed. We sure know that he didn't want you to fail. It was all about going in and taking what he's given to us, succeeding at it. But there are different definitions of success. Success is not always discerned or decided or described by numbers or dollars or corporate thinking about what success is supposed to look like. All of us have business side to every ministry. Dollars are involved. Buildings are involved. But what we know is that that's not what it's all about. It's not about the building you walk in, even though you want it to be excellent. Yeah, I mean, follow my heart in all of this. I'm not slamming anything other than deception. But we just know this. We know that it's not just about the building, although we want it done with excellence. You know, Vic and I, we came out of the Jesus Revolution, Jesus Movement days. We got saved in 1971. And it was just two years later that we were out here at, at Brother Copeland's conference, we immediately, within months, connected to Brother Copeland's ministry in 1971 and just started to hear the word of faith and, and realized that this was it for us. But in those days, you know, we had, I, I checked out a couple of nice looking church building places to go to church. I didn't know anything about Jesus really. I'd gone to a church at, as a kid, some religious thinking about church life, but I really didn't have any clue as to what it meant to be a Christian and walk with Jesus. Not really. I won't go into all of that detail, but the point I want to make is I'd gone into some fine looking church buildings. They had really nice stained glass and I still like stained glass. But when there's no life on the inside of it, it really doesn't care how pretty it is or how good the music is or how clear the sermon might be, even though the early sermons I heard came out of the newspaper. I don't know how these guys ever made it in anything. But I found and we found and in those early days, there was something on the inside of us that if it was pure, if it was up from the heart, maybe only an acoustic guitar, which we still love, an acoustic guitar leading the worship for you just to enter in, not just sing a song, but really enter into a presence and understand that this is a moment that God is really interacting and I'm having an encounter with the presence of God right now. And making that available to anybody, man, God just shows up and something happens. That's what it's really all about, don't you think? It's about when something happens that is life-changing and impacts you. Now, for some people, that can happen with a lot of music and big instruments and others. It's just a little guitar or totally solo. You know, there's some folks that figured instruments are not of God anyway, and they have no instruments whatsoever. That's sad in my opinion. <laughs> Wisely stewarding the anointing is what our times together and really our times in the presence of God is all about. Wisely stewarding the presence of God, that we're giving honor to him. Now here's what we know. We know that God is everywhere. You know, people get saved in the bars. I've got a friend, he got saved sitting on a bar stool, half drunk. Started talking to the guy next to him about Jesus. Messed up their whole deal for why they were at the bar. But this guy gave his life to the Lord sitting in a bar. So we know God's everywhere, but God doesn't seem to move the same way in the bar as he does here. 
How many of you know that's true? That he, how do you know that actually? <laughs> On a personal level. I was just, just curious. Well, that's what I hear. We wisely steward the anointing of God. And in these days, having the word as final authority as we've established in our lives and God reiterating that to us in a big way to live fearless, full of faith, surrounded by favor, to wisely steward these things means that God wants to bring light and insight beyond what we've already walked in so that we do it with greater excellence in these days than we have in the days past. What we also know is that in these days, there are those that have not been hearing with an open heart. They've not kept themselves in a place of wisely stewarding revelation, maybe that they have had, and that the love of many, the agape love of many, the love that only is alive inside of believers, the God kind of love, the love of many will grow cold. We're warned that there are those who would have and allow their heart to get hardened. Let me read a few more scriptures about this before I jump down that road. Romans chapter 16, verse 25. Also from the Passion Translation, he says, I give all my praise and glory to the one who is more than enough power to make you strong and keep you steadfast through the promises found in the wonderful news that I preach. That is the proclaiming of Jesus, the anointed one. This wonderful news includes the unveiling of the mystery kept secret from the dawn of creation. Glory to God. Colossians chapter 1, verse 26. I'll just read a couple of things here for you. There is a divine mystery, a secret surprise. You think you've already had all the secrets unfolded to you? Oh, we've had the main one. Of course, Jesus is king and he's, he's alive in us. And that's what he goes on to tell us here. But there's details yet to be unwrapped. You know, for all of eternity, we're going to find the mysteries of the kingdom of God unfold for us. So he says, there is a divine mystery, a secret surprise that has been concealed from the world for generations but now it's being revealed, unfolded and manifest for every holy believer to experience. Living within you is the Christ who floods you with the expectation, floods you, look at that, with the expect, do you have an expectation for the glory of God the manifestation of his presence, he floods in you the manifest or the expectation for the manifestation of the presence of God. He said, this mystery of Christ embedded within us becomes a heavenly treasure chest of hope filled with the riches of glory for his people and God wants everyone to know it. Yeah. Glory to God. Yeah. Revelation. God wants everyone to know. We've received revelation, but there is still revelation to come. We've received the revelation that Jesus is Lord, that we belong to God, that we've been forgiven, that we are the righteousness of God in Christ. Actually, Hebrews chapter five and verse 13 in the mirror translation says this. It reads this way. 
Re the revelation of righteousness is the meat of God's word. Revelation of the righteousness of God in us is the very meat of how we develop and grow everything in our life. It takes revelation, not just information. Now, I enjoy good information, and we've had some great information here, but it always has come with real revelation. That's absolutely vital in what we do. We're not just spewing out information. Information alone can just end up boring you. I remember I was in one Bible school teaching as a guest, not the one here, by the way, as I want to preface this just right. Another Bible school elsewhere. And I was there as a guest and I was waiting for my session and I was in a back room just waiting for things to begin for my session to go out and, and I could teach. And the, the dean of that particular school came back into the office. He had just finished his session. And he came into the office and greeted me and somebody else. And he says, you know, I was so boring just now. I bored myself. <laughs> That's bad boredom right there. Even in Bible school settings, it's vital that we are, we're dealing with revelation. Certainly information. We want to get the history of things and understand how things are positioned just right. And I've loved the Greek and Hebrew stuff that I get from these people that know so much more than me. And I love these people because when you quote them, you sound just as smart as they are. <laughs> Years ago, I asked Rick Renner. We love Rick Renner. I asked him, I said, how does your brain work? How does that, <laughs> how does that, how does that happen? And before he could answer, I just said, Rick, would you just lay your hands on me just in case you could impart any of that? He just smiled. He didn't lay hands on me though. The Rotherham translation of Colossians 1.26 reads this way. He said, the sacred secret. Well, I love that terminology. The sacred secret, which has been hidden away for all the ages and from generations, but now has been made manifest unto us, his saints, unto whom God has been pleased to make known what is the glorious wealth of this sacred secret among the nations, which is Christ in you, Say it out loud, Christ in me, the hope of glory. Not just the hope of heaven, the hope of the manifestations of the presence of God, not only in the future, but in the now. Faith is not just about the future. In fact, faith is about now. This whole concept of time that somebody was just doing an amazing job talking about, it's like wild that time is a creation. That God doesn't exist. He, he influences the realm of time, but he exists outside of time. He, he exists in eternity. And this is why God makes sense to us, even though we can't explain eternity. I mean, it's forever. It doesn't have a beginning. It doesn't have an end. Huh? How does that work? Everything we know has a beginning and has an end. God had to start somewhere, but he didn't. He always was. This is a time issue that your brain hadn't really wrapped around all that well yet. Even you smart folks. <laughs> but we get glimpses into it, don't we? We get glimpses of revelation to be able to bring what is true in eternity and impose it into a realm of time. That's what faith does. It reaches out into the things of the spirit that are eternal. And we do that because we are eternal. We have that capacity. And we draw those things into this realm of time. This is what David did. You remember when David was confronted by Nathan the prophet over his sin with Bathsheba. 
Whew, this was a dark time in, in human history for David, for sure. He thought he had controlled and managed his situation and his sin. You know, sin is not something you really get to manage. No matter how good you think you are at managing sin, you're, you're going to mess up because sin has deceived you into believing. All right, you know. Anyway, <laughs> David was deceived into believing. He had managed his sin and everything was under control until Nathan the prophet showed up. You know, if you're in sin and a prophet of God comes knocking at your door, you get on your knees and repent before you open that door. Nathan came in, led David down a conversation that David followed like a lamb to the slaughter. And you know what Nathan said? He said, you are that man that has done this sin and violated these people. And this was a sin that there was no forgiveness for. There was no offering to offer. There was no sacrifice to be given. The only thing he had ahead of him was to be executed just like anybody else who had committed adultery. There was no forgiveness under the law for that sin. So what does David do? David understands something about God that nobody talked about. Now, David was playing no games with his sin, not at all. So don't read into this the wrong thing. But David understood the heart of God was not to destroy, not really, even though there was no forgiveness for his sin, it wasn't the heart of God for David to be destroyed. It was the heart of God for David to be forgiven and delivered. And David understood that. Nobody really grasped that. It wasn't being taught by the, by the teachers of the day and by the rabbis of his time. But David knew something about God that was so powerful that he literally reached into eternity forward in time, which is amazing, and pulled new covenant forgiveness into his situation. And he wrote Psalm 51 as a result. Glory to God. We're living in a time frame now where we get glimpses into the heart of God and into the nature of God to forgive, to reveal, to bless, to increase, to prosper. We grab hold of those things and we pull them by faith out of eternity and into our present situation. This is what faith has the capacity to do. This is why you're commissioned to teach and preach faith because God's not willing for people to just live under the, uh, the kind of limitations that they've lived with. But it takes a different kind of thinking, doesn't it? It takes the thoughts of faith. It takes a mindset that yields to that concept of faith. Without the right mindset, you end up deceived, weakened, defeated, even though you've known some of the right things to do. The histories of Herodotus, the Greek historian, from about, well, he was in the 400s BC. He tells the story in some of his writings. It's just a short story in volumes of history that he wrote. But he wrote about the Scythians. The Scythians are actually mentioned in the book of Colossians, right after the barbarians. I came to know about the barbarians because you come to realize that the Irish, Burke being an Irish name, the Irish are not mentioned in the Bible. Italians are in there. The Irish are not in there. And so I was not troubled, but I was interested to see if maybe there was any kind of reference to the Irish, the Celts. And it turns out in Colossians, when the Scythians are mentioned, the barbarians are also mentioned. And Turns out that that referred to the Celts. So there we are right there in the Bible. I just want you to know that. But the Scythians in their history, they were a barbaric people. They were, they were nomadic people in Asia and across 
some regions of Russia in their history. And there was a point in time where as they had gone to battle and they, they fought everybody, it seemed like. They were just ruthless type of people. And they didn't take a lot of captives often. They really executed most people. But they had taken some captive and turned them into slaves and gouged out their eyes. So they wouldn't cause the kind of trouble that I guess slaves with eyes could cause. I don't know how that thinking goes. So, you know, you just kind of guess. But they went on a long campaign, an actual 28 year campaign where they were out battling various nations and they actually had finished conquering the Medes at this stage of history when after 28 years they came back to the region that they had left where they had left their wives and they had left these blinded slaves. But what they were met with when they came back into this region was the children that were born of these wives and these blind slaves who are now young men fighting warriors. And when these elder Scythians returned, those young men came out to battle against the Scythians because they didn't want them back. They were out on the battlefield and the Scythians were fighting these young men and they were going back and forth. No one was winning. The Scythian elders were dying. The young men were dying on the battlefield. Nobody's gaining ground. They're fighting with their regular weaponry and nothing is being done to succeed and win this battle. They just are defeating each other slowly. And finally, one of the Scythian elders had this idea. He said, Ben, we are not winning this battle. We're losing men and we're losing the men who will be future slaves for us as we win this. Everybody's dying, nobody's winning. So here's what we must do. We must throw down our weapons, our axes, our shields, all of our weaponry, and we must go out onto the battlefield carrying only the whips of masters. And the Scythians decided that this man had an idea that they felt would, would work. They dropped their weapons. They went back to the battlefield carrying only whips and began to crack the whips out on that battlefield over and over again, cracking the whip. The sound of the whips of masters resonated in the ears of these young men who were raised with a slavery mentality. And those young men dropped their weapons and ran and ultimately were defeated by the Scythians. Their mindset was that of a slave. They would win as long as they saw themselves as equal to the Scythians, but the moment that Scythian army became the masters in their mind. They were defeated on that battlefield. You can have an ability and have a wrong mindset. You can have an idea. You can have truth from God's word and not have victory and success if your mindset is not what it must be. Those young men really had the capacity to beat those Elder Scythians, but they lost out on the battlefield. You get it. A few years back, Vicki Vicky had an experience where she, she just dealt with something that God brought a revelation over that was amazing. She had a friend that was encouraging her just to test her her artistic skills. Vicki has been just an amazing administrator of great uh, mind and organized and just phenomenal person. Is 
Brother Copeland mentioned even in his office and of course in our ministry, it's just been phenomenal what she's been able to do over the years. But this friend was encouraging her to take up painting just as a, a hobby, just as something as an outlet. And this person, a friend, had herself been a painter and she had known Vicki and known that Vicki, uh, a little about Vicki's family and encouraged Vicki to, that, you know, there's talent in, for painting and for art and, and your siblings and in your mom and, and it's been evident and surely you have talent like that and, and it's in there. And Vicki said, you know, my mom told me when I was 13 years old, I wanted to take an art class. My mom told me when I asked to take that art class, she said, Vicki, you have no talent. You need to be a secretary and you need to take classes that will develop that side of your thing. And she wasn't trying to be mean. She just believed that. And Vicki believed that. Well, when she told this friend of that, she heard it come out of her own mouth. It was a limiter. It was something that had been instilled in her with a statement that she'd embraced. And she told her friend, she said, but I'm telling you today that that dies. I'm killing it. Glory to God. And she killed that limiter, did away with that stronghold that had held her from something that is now, five years later, turned into an amazing hobby that is a little more than a hobby, really. And I just enjoy the fact that one of the earliest paintings that she painted that she was able to share with some people, just excited about this painting. Somebody had commented, several people, many had commented on her, uh, her painting and how nice it was. And, this, and then somebody said, uh, can I buy that? And Vicky said, look at there. What the devil tried to steal from me has not only turned into a victory, but somebody wants to buy it. Her answer to that person was, everything's got a price. <laughs> she sold that painting. <laughs> Glory to God. And that wasn't her goal in this. It was just to step into a new place that she had come to grips with over an insight and a revelation of who she was in Christ and who she was not. She was not limited. Ooh, that blesses me. I love that. Glory to God. You still here? There was a moment in Israel's history Well, let me read something else to you before I jump to that. On further in Matthew 13, Jesus is still talking about that revelation knowledge. And he says this in verse 14, he said, the prophecy of Isaiah describes them perfectly, those who were not hearing. Although they listen carefully to everything I speak, they don't understand a thing I say. They look and pretend to see, but their eyes, the eyes of their heart are closed. Their minds are, now listen to this, their minds are dull and slow to perceive. Their ears are plugged and are hard of hearing and they have deliberately shut their eyes to the truth. Otherwise, they would open their eyes to see. They would open their ears to hear. They would open their minds to understand and they would turn to me and let me instantly heal them. Glory to God. The eyes, the ears, and the heart. We choose to open our eyes to see, to hear with our ears, but to embrace with our heart revelation knowledge and the ideas of what it means to live by faith and walk in the authority of God's word. We're not just learning to be Christians to follow the rules. We understand there are things you do to walk in the blessing of God. So I'm not contradicting that idea at all. But what we understand is that we have to embrace this revelation knowledge that we will live by it and not allow our hearts to be hardened. I started down this road earlier, but I'll just jump to it now. 
We're living in a time frame when we're going to watch the hard-hearted believers, and that sounds so rough to say, the hard-hearted leaders shift away from walking in faith and let go of things that God has commissioned them to walk in. I've made a choice a long time ago, but I've renewed that choice even now and even today. I am not one of them. My eyes are open. My ears are, are open. My heart embraces how to live and revelation knowledge, how to follow the flow of the Spirit of God, and that it's not just about information, that it's about an impartation of the anointing and the presence and power of God. This is one of the things that is such a struggle when you're dealing with a very short time frame in a service. And I get the idea and the reason for having limitations on time, duplicate services, dual Sunday mornings. One, you got to get one crowd out and, and another crowd in and deal with the parking lot. And there's lots of issues. And apparently all of those are valid issues because God was involved in this idea of having dual services. I mean, you wouldn't have dual services if God wasn't in it, would you? Well, that was weak. But God can do in a few minutes what it takes guys like me an hour and a half to get to. Come on, you guys look so very controlled. That flow of the Holy Spirit. But we're in a time frame right now where we have to be wise and understand that there have been some tremendous men and women of God that have gone in dangerous and destructive directions. And we have to make the choices. And this was really the warning that God wanted me to, to bring today, just to know that every one of us have to make choices that exempt us. We are not exempted automatically because we're in a conference like this. This helps the cause of staying on the right track. But there are choices to be made that we're going to live by faith. We're going to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. We're not just going to impart information to people. We're not looking just to fill up the time. We're looking for there to be an impartation of the Spirit of God. And that can come in a teaching of an outline if that's how God leads you. Don't get me wrong. It's not all about shooting from the hip all the time. We understand, though, that the Holy Spirit wants to be able to interrupt us at times and move us off of the direction that we thought we might have right this minute and move into a different direction. Now, having been around Brother Copeland for all of these years, I've watched him masterfully follow that zone and that stream as the Holy Spirit would move him from one concept and one idea to another by the leadership of the Holy Spirit, always following a plan that amazingly comes together in the end. How did that fit with this? I don't know, but then you come to it, bam, here comes that clarity of the Spirit of God. Woo! Hallelujah. So ladies and gentlemen, we are those who have been given the hidden secrets, mysteries, not hidden from us. And that doesn't give us a reason for pride. Pride is part of the path that's going to mess you up. So we're not looking at it in that way at all. We're looking at it as a, an honor and a, a sense of appreciation. God, thank you for using me. Thank you for giving me this ministry, this congregation, this voice, this place to be able to do what you've called me to do. We do it with gratitude in the name of Jesus. Can you say amen to this? Amen. Israel stood on the edge of the promised land. 
Moses sent those spies into the land to go take a look. The 12 spies came back, but only two actually saw it as a land that God wanted them to see. The other people weren't in themselves bad people. They were picked out among the elite of each tribe to be able to go in and represent the tribe and be spies in that land. So these aren't flaky people. They were just very wrong. Only Joshua and Caleb came back with, with a word that we can take this land. The majority, however, totally disagreed. You know, you can't always go with the majority. Just because there's a lot of people on one side of the track doesn't mean that that's the right track to be and the right place to be. We've learned how to lean into the wind, not just follow the wind. But something happened to all of Israel with the report of the majority. Everything was put on pause for them to go in and possess that land. They could have gone in then. That was the idea of sending the spies in to see it. But the majority and all of Israel followed the majority's mindset and they caved in and their hearts were melted. Our words can either melt people's hearts or empower them. And what God has given you, it's all about empowering them to do what God has assigned them to do in Jesus name. Well, that's what I have for you today. Stand up with me. Lord, we lay hold on these things in the name of Jesus. I pray for this revelation knowledge to flood through us, yes. every single one of us, that we can see the things that you've called us into and to see it with clarity, fear-free, full of faith, and surrounded by favor in Jesus' name. Glory to God. Amen. Dennis, I had a wrong concept of why the Lord sent me to war you. I decided, I decided since I really missed it by not wanting to go. I took that to mean that I was gonna go ahead and stay four full years, mm. go to graduate school. I had that in my mind, that's what I was gonna do. I didn't get the concept. Right. And I finished that semester all geared up. I went to my, the, the, uh, my uh, landlord, was a Mormon attorney. Hmm. And he let me know right quick that Jesus Christ was his Lord and Savior. <clears throat> I had him draw up the Kenneth Copeland Evangelistic Association in the state of Oklahoma. I planned to stay, fly that airplane. But school was out. First day, I didn't know where to go. So I just went in and put my suit on, got my Bible and went in the living room my legal pad and started studying. And the Lord said, I'm ready for you now. Mm -mm -mm. I was about to blow this thing just as bad as I did in the first place. Mm. Dennis Burke, though, his reason for putting me in there was a combination of two men, Oral Roberts and Kenneth E. Hagan. Glory, Glory to God. And the, the non-compromise, Oral Roberts preached a sermon and said, if you bow, you burn. If you don't bow, you can't burn. Don't ever compromise the word of God or faith because whatever you compromise to keep, you will eventually lose. Yes. Wow. Don't compromise this book Amen. and walk in love. And walk in love. Use your faith and walk in love. Mm -hmm. In Oklahoma City, Oral suddenly said, Kenneth, I jumped, I was driving the car. Do these three things and you'll always succeed. Number one, find out the will of God. Number two, confer no longer with flesh and blood. Number three, get your job done at any cost. Yes, sir. Praise God. Find out his will and don't bend. 
and the integrity of that. Mm. And all of the times that man, I'd shoot off in that direction and shoot off in that direction. Uh, and the Lord, it was easy for him to pull the, it wasn't just me, it was Gloria and everybody involved in this ministry, George and Terry, all of us together, to pull you back. And when I was flying into Meacham Field that night, coming to you from the revival capital of the world, mm. and I heard it audibly, I checked my audio panel to make sure it was down instead of up. Had no idea what he's talking about. Mm. Look at that. So we found out who owned it. And the Lord said, you don't go see him till I tell you to. Yeah. I was shaving one morning. He said, go see Mr. Pewitt. Glory to God. And he said, remember what your dad said and keep your mouth shut. You want to know what my dad said? Talking about my dad is a world-class salesman, trained, trained over a thousand men in the life insurance business. He said, Kenneth, Samson killed a thousand men with the jawbone of an ass. Ten times that many sales have been killed with the same weapon. <laughs> he said, keep your mouth shut and listen to what other people have to say. And true listening is when you're not thinking about what you're going to say when they get through. Yeah, right. You just stand there. Come to find out Mr. Pewitt was a thinker. It took him a long time to answer anything I said. He was 89 years old and was worth $350 million. Mm. He was a bachelor, never had married, big supporter of SMU. And I found out later that Oral Roberts was his hero. Wow. But I didn't, he didn't let me know any of that. It took days. Mm. I learned a lot from him. Now we're here today because it was this property. Over 1,500 acres here. It belonged to the United States government. It was a, a Marine air station, it was a Naval air station operated by the Marine Corps. He bought it from the government. Take the time it's quick snap decisions that'll get you into trouble. Mm. That first thought most of the time is right, but you find out what it is and take the time. Listen and listen and listen and don't do anything until the Lord says do it. When we began to drill for, for natural gas out here, I had people kept telling me it's here. Well, I believed what they said because they were people of authority. Right. I said, Lord, what do I do? He said, nothing until I tell you. Later, when all these gas wells came in, I said, Lord, all the time we needed that money so badly. What didn't we? He said, listen, The gas wells needed to be product of the message instead of the message being the product of the gas wells. Wow, wow, right. And that was the difference, right? Praise oh, God. glory to God. Oh, man, hallelujah. That was the difference, yeah. right? Wow. <laughs> awesome. Thank you for that message as yes, well. Yes, sir. Glory Thank to you. God.